Welcome back to the studio. Uh, we just heard uh, Patrick Nicolet giving us, giving us his perspective on cybersecurity for space, market, technical trends. Now we're getting into the, the real material, getting lower into the, the, the technical layers. It's my great pleasure to, uh, to welcome on the stage here at the Davos Congress Center, uh, Alexandre Karloff. He's the chief technical officer of SISEC. Uh, SISEC is a cybersecurity company based in Lausanne, Switzerland, uh, active on various verticals uh, with the technology around confidential computing. Uh, Alexander is a cryptographer by education uh, with a PhD in cryptography from EPFL Switzerland and has uh, worked his entire career in uh, cybersecurity and is also uh, playing uh, capture the flag competitions uh, during uh, his spare time. We'll talk about that uh, later tomorrow with the uh, ethical hackers. Uh, Alex, the, 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 the floor is yours if you're ready. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mathieu. Um, so I hope now everybody has the, the sound, can see me. Uh, and I will start by apologizing for, uh, for the small hiccups that we had with the sound, because ultimately it's, uh, it's always the CTO's fault, uh, because even if the printer is not working or the uh, internet is not working in the startup, the CTO has up to apologize. So sorry for, uh, for that, and I think we, uh, we managed to, well, to quickly catch up. And uh, yeah, so we are back online, uh, things going smoothly. Um, yeah, so Matthew uh, did a quick introduction about myself, um, so I won't have any uh, bio page or anything, so yeah, I'm CTO at SISEC, uh, so basically in charge of development, um, engineering and uh, technology. Uh, as Matthew said, I spent uh, yeah, almost of my entire career uh, in uh, uh, information security and crypto, before actually world crypto became hype and uh, started to mean uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, yeah, so the goal of the, of the talk would be to, uh, yeah, as, uh, as Matthew said, uh, we'll be going more and more into technical details, but it's more to give you an overview um, of, the, of some attacks and, uh, let's say, the, the approach, how we can, how we can approach uh, the security of, uh, of, satellite, uh, of satellite missions. So, uh, obviously, I'm, uh, I'm an information security uh, specialist myself, but I have not that much worked in, uh, uh, let's say, in, in satellite communication. Um, so nevertheless, um, yeah, we, we see more and more uh, people speaking about, uh, about satellite hacking in the news. Um, so there are some notable historical, uh, historical hacks. Um, so it's all started with, uh, I think, well, uh, let's say f for, for hackers taking uh, control of satellites in uh, 1998. Uh, when, uh, when hackers took control of, uh, of a U.S.-German uh, Rosat astronomy satellite. I think somebody previously mentioned it already uh, this morning. Uh, so actually, they, they fully took control of, uh, uh, of, the, of the telecommand and managed to, uh, well, to rotate and to direct the, the solar panels uh, towards the sun, uh, leading to uh, overcharging the batteries and, well, basically to the, to the loss of satellite. Um, in 1999, uh, hackers managed to, to gain control of a UK uh, Skynet satellite uh, for a ransom. So it was like the first example of uh, ransomware, uh, even in space. Uh, and actually, recently, uh, we saw uh, uh, last year a capture the flag uh, competition happening on a satellite uh, organized by, uh, by American Air Force together with, uh, I think, with, uh, with DEFCON. Um, and well, unfortunately, I was not able to, uh, to take part uh, since uh, yeah, uh, building, building uh, new, new space uh, security systems takes, uh, takes a lot of time. But yeah, I hope to, uh, to see more and more this kind of competition taking, uh, uh, being organized and yeah, some, uh, sometime in the future to also take part in this. Um, what's interesting, so... Um, and this was also uh, also mentioned, I think, by Florian uh, Schutz before. Uh, the oldest example uh, of uh, satellite hacking actually goes back to uh, to eighties. Um, so um, so actually, yeah, the the story quickly goes like this. So broadcasting companies uh, were implementing uh, uh, at the beginning. So the the goal is to broadcast uh, some uh, some premium content, uh, TV shows, or uh, 
uh, or sports, and uh, the broadcasting companies were started starting by implementing the, sec the security by obscurity approach by scrambling the signal. And then at the beginning of the 80s, people started to uh, actually to build a system to, to catch satellite signals with uh, with antennas. So it, it was just taking an antenna to uh, to be able to to well to decode actually the signal. And um, yeah, there was this story that uh, Florian mentioned about a guy called uh, uh, called Captain Midnight. Uh, so his name was John, who actually was selling this uh, satellite equipment. Uh, and then uh, when uh, when HBO started to uh, uh, to scramble the, the satellite signal. He went sort of out of business, started working for a, for a satellite uplink uh, company, and one, uh, at one time he actually he managed to jam the uplink uh, signal uh, for, a, for a show and uh, yeah, to show some message on all the TVs of the, of the TV viewers. Um, so in, uh, then later in the, in the 90s, um, broadcasters started to uh, actually to really I think take care of the, you know, to, to try to implement the proper encryption of, uh, of satellite signals. Things like uh, DVB, so DVB uh, became uh, a digital video broadcasting standard, so uh, things like the DVB CSA appeared, so the common scrambling algorithm. Um, smart cards uh, started to be used for key management uh, and key handling, so it was like first uh, example of a secure uh, environment for uh, uh, for, for key storage and operation. And that's also interesting because that's where um, the proper hardware hacking uh, actually started. So people, actually the incentive was so big to, uh, to hack into these systems uh, that a lot of uh, hackers started to, uh, uh, yeah, to try to reverse engineer the, the smart cards, the algorithm in order to, uh, to watch TV for free. And that's, um, that's where actually the, yeah, the, the proper uh, this hardware embedded system hacking uh, started. Um, so I think that, yeah, the important thing to, to note here is that uh, as long as people, or let's say the attacker has the incentive, uh, system can be, can be broken. So for, uh, for new space, uh, well, uh, for somebody like me, new space means uh, new hacks. Uh, the good thing uh, for, for technology is that um, Actually, the space, uh, the access to space, becomes uh, more and more widely available. Uh, but as uh, Jose mentioned previously, the actually, yeah, the, the the fact that it becomes more and more available, uh, new technology uh, becomes really widely widely accessible. It also uh, becomes more easy for uh, for satellite hackers to you know to access these components. Uh, and if I just what I've said previously, uh, th so those people who uh, are in the same trend of people who, are, who try to reverse engineer and to hack into smart cards, uh, they continue to, you know, they, they can continue to access those, uh, those new embedded platforms and just, uh, and just, you know, play around and try to understand the system. So that's like uh, how, how the hacking works. Um, and obviously this leads to, uh, to the increase of the, of the risks, uh, since many new manufacturers are involved. Uh, there are m many or quite a number of outsourcing uh, companies who provide new space uh, components. Um, so it also means that, I mean, for, for an attacker or for a, for a hacker, it's easy to purchase uh, these common uh, components, like, you know, uh, many systems, uh, many embedded systems are built on, uh, on ARM uh, CPUs or on uh, uh, an FPGA like uh, Xilinx. Uh, so actually, the, yeah, the, the attackers can uh, can just purchase uh, those components, uh, play with them, and try to to find uh, uh, to find the vulnerability. So it's like your typical uh, penetration testing, but with uh, unlimited time and uh, and resources. Um, so well, the the satellite or a space system uh, is sort of you can see it as a as a computer information system where you have, uh, of course, a, a radio frequency medium uh, between the, the Earth and the, and the space. And the fact that the satellite, once it's launched, uh, it's not, uh, it's not easy, easily physically accessible. Um, nevertheless, uh, the number of uh, attack vectors uh, that, can be, that can be exploited is, uh, is well, uh, is large, actually. Um, so the most, I think the most, uh, 
frequently and I would say easily uh, exploitable. Uh, so it's just to give you an example. Uh, attack vector is the payload eavesdropping. Um, so it means that yeah, you just you just listen of, uh, on the on the signal. You just point your antenna towards uh, towards the satellite. Uh, that's how the the pay TV hacking actually happened. Um, another uh, so in other examples where uh, um, where like uh, eavesdropping on uh, uh, on IP communication via via satellite. So this uh, Turla uh, advanced persistent threat uh, I just showed in the in the first slide, were abusing actually downlink uh, signal from the satellite to uh, to hide their uh, command and control servers. Um, so that's that's quite an let's say an easy target for uh, for for attackers. Um, of course, I mean the the the, the holy grail uh, of a of a of a hacker is an access to. Uh, uh, to TTC, uh, so the, the telemetry and uh, telecommand of, uh, over satellite, which is, well, of course, much harder. Uh, otherwise, we would have seen many satellites falling uh, from the sky. But it's yeah, from what we see, uh, it still can be can be achieved. So yeah, then uh, obviously the the solution might be uh, well, we just encrypt everything. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's the typical answer. Um, so it's. I think it's more subtle than uh, than that. So of course, at the bare minimum, uh, the telecommand has to have some form of uh, form of authentication, uh, because otherwise you just listen to what the, the ground station sends to the to the satellite and you just replay the uh, the signal. Um, so the the historically, I would mean the. Um, the approach was to uh, to use what we call the message authentication code to uh, to protect the integrity uh, and authenticity of the of the commands, and uh, and the MAC. So the, the message authentication code is based on uh, on symmetric encryption, and the um, the usual uh, the usual question is like, what happens if the if the key gets compromised? So it's the same since the same key is used on board of the satellite and uh, and the ground station. So for example, if somebody manages to uh, uh, to access this key or this key is leaked. Um, yeah, then th it means the uh, the satellite, this this security mechanism is uh, is broken. Uh, so then, what we can we do? Well, we we, we put a second key, uh, which uh, which we will use to uh, uh, establish of a confidential secure channel. Uh, so uh, typically, the usually the algorithm which is used is AES, which is uh, stands for Advanced Encryption Standard. Um, it's still considered the state of the art, uh, so it's, it's a strong, uh, strong cipher. Um, but then, once again, the question is, what happens if this key gets uh, gets compromised? So we uh, we, we start to have some sort of uh, uh, cat and mouse uh, game. Um, so fortunately, uh, uh, the what we call the asymmetric cryptography uh, got uh, uh, got developed. Uh, which relies actually on uh, uh, on the notion of public key and private key. So we use uh, two different keys for uh, for different operations. So for instance, uh, sort of so things like encryption. Uh, so anybody can encrypt uh, with uh, with the public key, which is uh, public material. But then uh, only the the entity uh, having access to the to the private key can uh, can decrypt actually the message. And um, Another uh, interesting uh, property, which uh, which was enabled by uh, by symmetric cryptography, was the what we call signature. So signature of the messages. Uh, signature happens with uh, with the private key. So uh, uh, only the person or the entity uh, who has access to the private key can uh, sign the message. And then everybody, since the public key is the uh, is a public uh, public uh, piece of data, can verify actually that this. Uh, message was signed by the uh, by the entity which is in uh, possession of the private key. Um, so yeah, the symmetric cryptography allows uh, an establishment of secure channels, uh, payload authentication, uh, in some cases key revocation. So we have notions uh, such as uh, public key infrastructure, uh, and also importantly uh, firmware uh, firmware authentication. But then. Uh, the issue becomes uh, the key management. Um, so we can, uh, of course, with uh, maybe with two or three keys, uh, uh, it's easy to imagine uh, how to build this kind of system. 
Um, but then we can have uh, different keys for, uh, uh, for payload, for uh, telecommand, uh, for telemetry. Uh, then also we have a notion of, uh, of satellite constellations, uh, which can require an increasing number of, uh, of keys. Um, so then we have the challenge of satellites joining the, the constellations, leaving from the, set, uh, from the constellation. Um, what happens if the key gets compromised? So we have to have a procedure to, uh, to do key revocation. And uh, also, ultimately, the question is how do we, uh, how do we protect uh, the private keys which are, uh, which are on board of the satellite or also uh, on the Earth uh, at, the, at the ground station? Um, so that's where we are uh, coming to, uh, uh, yeah, so speaking of the, of the sensitive material protection, um, this is where we start to speak about uh, what we call the trusted execution environment. Uh, so that's uh, the, I would say, the usual technology on which uh, we rely uh, on Earth. Um, so the, the trusted execution environment or trusted uh, computing base is the minimum uh, amount of software and hardware uh, we can trust. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the trust has to start somewhere. Uh, the trust cannot happen out of the, out of the air. Um, and actually, we can see the satellite, and I think uh, Patrick uh, also mentioned it as a, uh, a sort of natural uh, trusted execution environment, or let's say natural environment, uh, which, uh, which can protect the key because it's in space, so physical access is, uh, is hard. Uh, once it's launched, uh, well, we can consider that the key uh, uh, is protected, but the pre-launch access remains uh, quite of a risk. Uh, so the attacker can tamper with, uh, with satellite hardware, software, can try to pu put backdoors. We have uh, things like uh, we start uh, seeing more and more uh, supply chain attack. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, uh, and also on, uh, on board we can... Um, uh, as it was mentioned previously, we, we have this interaction between uh, uh, many payloads. Uh, so different uh, di well, uh, different companies put their payloads on the on the same bus on the on the satellite, and um, yeah, there might be some payload which uh, would, for some reason, try to interact with uh, or attack uh, other components of the of the satellite. Um, so yeah, so. Um, Things like a need for, uh, for uh, isolation uh, comes to mind, and uh, also what is, uh, well, as I've said, we, uh, we have to, uh, to start from, uh, from somewhere, so that the trusted execution environment is uh, usually built from, uh, from the notion of root of trust. So we have some, uh, some trusted uh, component or some, uh, some trusted uh, key, which is either hard-coded or fused or uh, uh, like the piece of uh, hardware that we ultimately trust and from which uh, we can uh, uh, basically unroll uh, all the other components, uh, the operating system, the applications, uh, which will sort of inherit uh, this trust coming from this uh, trust, uh, trust anchor and the, and the root of trust. So we have things like, uh, for instance, Secure Boot, uh, which allows us to, uh, to have uh, confidence that uh, once the system is booted, uh, actually the environment was not backdoored or there are no uh, uh, additional functionalities or try-ons uh, inserted. Um, so another, uh, I would say, interesting um, vector uh, of attack is uh, obviously the ground segment because it's, uh, it's on Earth, uh, it's complex. Uh, and actually the, for, for an attacker, the successful compromise of the of the ground segment means the the control of the of the satellite or uh, of the of the constellation and also of the of the payload and uh, for the ground segment we we have all the types of uh, uh, of standard attacks such as uh, network exploitation uh, so cloud infrastructure attacks uh, data theft and corruption and uh, also on ground segment we we use uh, common components or common uh, software uh, yeah, sof software parts which uh, very often are uh, you know easily available for for studies and for uh, for research of vulnerabilities we can also have physical uh, physical attacks and here the fact is is that uh, the heterogeneity of uh, of these components and the complexity 
uh, actually increases the uh, increases the, the yeah the the, uh, the parts of the ways where we have uh, we can have uh, vulnerabilities. So ultimately, the more complex the system is, uh, the the less secure it will be from the from the start. So then the question is how we can uh, how we what what can we do? So uh, um, and here, well, there uh, there is no, uh, as I would say, a rocket science. Uh, security methodologies uh, exist, uh, so I will quickly uh, uh, quickly go over uh, some, let's say, some important uh, parts of uh, of this uh, kind of methodologies. Uh, so these things are not new; they were used for uh, for some time for software development, for uh, system engineering. Uh, and I think the, yeah, the most important part we start with is really understanding the system, uh, then doing the threat modeling, uh, risk analysis, uh, then we see what kind of uh, trade-offs or uh, countermeasures we have to put in place. Uh, then we write the system requirements or the security uh, requirements for, uh, for, the, for the development or the design or the construction of the, of the system. Then we do implementation, uh, some tests, and uh, finally, the, well, you, you, you have to monitor your, uh, uh, your, uh, your system and well, perform uh, uh, operational management. Um, so here I would really um, emphasize uh, on, the, on the first, one of the first steps of, uh, of this uh, sort of methodology is uh, the system understanding. So actually it's, it's really important to understand, uh, to understand your system uh, because, as I've said, with, uh, with increased complexity, uh, new vulnerabilities uh, can appear. And um, so people, people tend to say, yeah, that's, that's outsourced to, uh, to some provider, so he definitely know, uh, knows better how to take care of security. Uh, still, you have to, uh, to know what your provider is doing, uh, ask him for... Uh, yeah, for for uh, for architecture, what kind of uh, measures he uh, the provider has put in place, so these kind of things. Um, once you have a full, uh, well, let's say, a good understanding of the of the system, um, you start with threat modeling, and threat modeling, uh, uh, so it's it's very much used in uh, software uh, software development, but it's also applied to general system design. There are different methodologies. Uh, but you start with uh, with listing your uh, most important assets, uh, threats, uh, what kind of uh, threat uh, agent you have uh, you have in front of you. So it's, if it's just some uh, uh, some let's say uh, medium uh, expertise uh, attacker, uh, it's one thing. But if it's like state sponsored uh, or advanced persistent threat, of course, different kind of uh, assumptions has to be has to be made. Then, as I've said, for uh, for methodology, you have uh, uh, different, uh, let's say, different techniques such as uh, DFD, so data, data flow diagrams and uh, stride analysis. You also do some scenario analysis. So, for instance, you can say uh, if I uh, if my TTC goes down for uh, for X, uh, I don't know, minutes or hours, what happens? And so you you try to to come up with uh, with all this kind of uh, scenario planning. Um, there is no actually there, there is no like a by the book or perfect uh, recipe for uh, for threat modeling. Of course, the more you do, uh, the more you start to uh, to see new threats or uh, let's say understand your your threat profile. But yeah, it's a, let's say it's, it's a continuous process. After the threat modeling, uh, what you do is the well you you can have a risk uh, risk profile of uh, of your system, and here you can start. Um, yeah, actually analyzing what kind of uh, uh, countermeasures uh, or remediation strategy uh, you can you can put in place, and that's basically your cost-benefit uh, analysis. So you uh, you you put in place some some uh, some protection mechanism. Of course, it will cost you, uh, but then at least you can clearly see uh, what kind of uh, uh, impact it will. Uh, uh, it will decrease or, uh, or kind of risk it will mitigate. So that's sort of, uh, and then you have a story for like, you, you, can, uh, you can explain or justify why you are, uh, you are, you are doing your, uh, your countermeasures and not 
just because for, for some checkbox. Of course, some of the, uh, some of the remediations will be, uh, uh, will be led by compliance requirements such as GDPR. But let's say in general, um, yeah, you, it's, it's always a cost-benefit uh, cost uh, benefit analysis. Um, maybe a few words about the uh, software uh, development life cycles, because what also I saw uh, from the projects we've done with, uh, uh, with our sp space uh, industry partners is that a lot of people are, uh, do some custom developments. Um, so, of course, there are a lot of frameworks. Uh, now we speak more and more about Agile, DevOps. Um, but I think here also is the, the important thing is to uh, think security from the, from, the, from the beginning. So integrate security into your software development lifecycle. Um, as straightforward as it may sound, uh, really integrate the risk mindset from, uh, from, the, from the very beginning. Um, think, as I've said before, threat model and uh, against which threats uh, you, are, uh, you are protecting. Um, so I think I'm gently arriving to the end of, the, uh, of my presentation. So just some few of concluding uh, remarks. Uh, know your system, obviously. Know well, very well your, your system. Uh, know your enemy. And unfortunately, attackers won't become less, uh, less sophisticated. Know your risks. Know your service providers and where your uh, uh, data is stored. Um, and well, from also from my experience and what we see, uh, security comes at cost. And uh, since this, let's say the uh, the return on investment for this kind of cost is not very straightforward, uh, it tends to to slip well towards the end of the priority list. And many people still uh, tend to do security for uh, to have the some checkbox uh, ticked. Um, yeah, so I think I, I hope that I managed my time not so bad, and uh, yeah, so if there are any questions. <laughs> we, we have some questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Alex. You covered a lot of ground. That was a very extensive presentation. Uh, I just want to confirm again to the participants that the slides will be available uh, for all participants uh, on, the, on the platform. Uh, a lot of topics. Uh, we do have some questions fo from, the, from the chat. Cool. Uh, I can start unless, Jose, you have some comments uh, about uh, Alexandre. Uh Let's go with the uh, questions. Okay. Um, first question is about uh, the new space approach, uh, especially using uh, components of the shelf, similar to uh, what we can find in IoT or in mm -hmm. embedded systems. How much does that affect uh, security? I th well, the question would be uh, the answer would be a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I've said, the, the I mean, for for somebody, for uh, let's say uh, uh, a company uh, uh, which would like to go to the to the new space, those components are widely ac uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as well as for uh, potential attackers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the um, I, I think I, I would repeat myself, but the, the hacker mindset is really, I would say, to uh, to gain knowledge and so it's uh, the ability to reverse engineer. Yes, the yes, of course. Like so if we take if we take uh, the the old space, uh, of course, it was much harder for uh, mm -hmm. uh, for potential attackers. So let's say people you know working in their garage to access some uh, military uh, mm -hmm. Soviet satellite or military U.S. satellite. But now, I mean, I can uh, you know I can build the satellite in my garage and I can start playing with it and I can. Uh, so you can buy the FPGA. Of course, you can. Uh, buy I can. I can. I can try to, and th that's what attackers will do. It they will search for vulnerabilities in a given component, mm -hmm. and if they found something which is unknown, it will be what we call the zero day uh, exploit, mm -hmm. and they they will use it to attack the uh, you know the system. Okay. Um, I got two questions about the differences uh, and the advantages and drawbacks of uh, symmetric versus asymmetric cryptography. Mm -hmm. um, does it make any difference in terms of key security? Uh, is it more secure to use uh, symmetric cryptography versus asymmetric? Is there any difference there? So let's say let, let, let's put it like this: from the from the key perspective. Uh, uh, you can you can match the key strength between the the symmetrical and the asymmetrical cryptography. What will change, nevertheless, is the performance. So of course, 
uh, symmetric crypto is much uh, faster, especially for embedded system, mm -hmm. uh, to implement, for instance, on board of the satellite than uh, some asymmetric, uh, asymmetric uh, cryptography. So it means that uh, asymmetric cryptography will be used for maybe for some, uh, you know, for some uh, specific operations. And then, of course, when you establish a secure channel, uh, of course, the symmetric, uh, you know, uh, advanced encryption standard will be will be used to to encrypt your data. But for um, for uh, let's say uh, for for key agreement or for signature, then you rely on asymmetric uh, uh, asymmetric cryptographic primitives. The thing to keep uh, important thing to keep in mind is that performance-wise, uh, there is a difference uh, mm -hmm. in implementation. So this is exactly uh, the job of the uh, security architecture definition yep. to look at the differences and what makes the most sense for a specific mission scenario. And um, I can, uh, yeah, I can tell you that uh, well, in space, you know, you count every every bit of uh, you know of the bandwidth, uh, and also uh, from the f from the bandwidth perspective, uh, asymmetric uh, primitive, mm -hmm. so asymmetric cryptographic primitive will tend to increase, uh, mm -hmm. so to put more overhead on. Uh, uh, on this bandwidth, so yeah, uh, from f for the for the architect, it's a it's a very important and uh, let's say yeah. difficult job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, similarly, it's still on that topic uh, about symmetric versus asymmetric. Uh, one question about the popularity, maybe not so much for you, Alex, uh, but at least in my experience, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, use of AES uh, crypto especially uh, featuring a either uh, 128 or 256 uh, keys, uh, a lot less about asymmetric crypto. Do you think this would be like a natural move for the industry to... to uh yeah, I, will, I would tend to answer in the following way. So I think uh, even in new space, uh, there are still, uh, let's say we rely still on, uh, on older... Uh, uh, space architectural uh, principles in terms of uh, mm -hmm. security and, uh, and cryptography, but uh, you know, as we see uh, in IoT, uh, these new primitives uh, come and they well, they will be used. So, uh, uh, of course, I mean, the more uh, you know, it's it's something. Uh, it's interesting. I will I will just give an example with uh, what happened in the you know I was speaking about this pay TV uh, industry and smart cards. So, of course, uh, 15 years ago, uh, smart cards were very low performance uh, devices it was not uh, possible to, you know to do some even rsa or public key cryptography on this kind of uh, devices and now we we have some small uh, you know uh, small chipsets in uh, even you know the for rfid tags in uh, in closes uh, like in in stores or i don't know in iot uh, which can do uh, elliptic curve uh, cryptography so yeah the uh, the, the performance will increase, so uh, uh, obviously it allows new new types of uh, crypto uh, crypto primitives. Yeah, we'll come back on these two topics: uh, new space cards as well as constellations, because uh, the number of satellites uh, to be deployed influence uh, a lot the type of cryptography you may choose for the for the mission. So we'll come back on that. We'll ask several other speakers, operators, about their views on, on cryptography. Um, I do have one last question uh, to wrap it up. Um, you talked about uh, SDLC. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very interesting. The, the question is, uh, what about the continuity in terms of security from the moment the satellite is designed all the way to its operation in space? How do you ensure uh, continuity in terms of security for the entire mission? This is a challenge, right? It, it can last years. You can have a lot of people working on the mission. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I think maybe something that I, uh, uh, I didn't emphasize uh, too much is that uh, things like threat modeling and risk assessment is a, is a continuous process. So it's not like you are, even if you've done the, the, risk, uh, the risk assessment, you just have a snapshot of the, of the system at one point of time. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, new vulnerabilities will, uh, will arrive. Uh, new exploits, uh, new attack vectors. So this is something you have to uh, to redo and you know to to, to make part of your uh, uh, yeah of your of your risk management uh, workflow. So uh, things like uh, well, I'm take some easy example, but you know uh, standards like ISO 271 uh, tell you to continuously improve the security of your system because of course if you do nothing, uh, the security of your system will decrease and eventually. Uh, somebody will find uh, a way in. So it's, the, it's a constant battle. Of you course, have to yeah. uh, stay up to date. Um, okay, uh, I think that's pretty much uh, for the Q&A. Jose, do you have any? Uh 
Well, I would say the major takeaway from your presentation is uh, the cybersecurity of a space system starts way before the launch. Of it's course. not something that you can implement on top of an existing system. Very early, even in the procurement of components, you have to be uh, uh, careful and in the way you, uh, you exchange information with your subcontractors and uh, the moment you start uh, distributing the developments and, and the operations. Uh, of this is absolutely fundamental. So for me, that's, that's really the, the big takeaway. And then uh, uh, a remark uh, in form of conclusion and transition. Uh, obviously, keys remain uh, fundamental, and uh, the, the privacy of the of the keys. So, the key transmission becomes really important because, presumably, the private keys will be loaded on the satellite. Sometimes at the very very last minute on the launch pad, mm -hmm. and then they're forever. But then, if the keys are compromised for one mm -hmm. reason or another then you may have to upload new uh, private keys, which means you have to have a safe way to upload keys. And that takes us to uh, what's going to be the subject of the next session, which is quantum technologies, because obviously the next step towards uh, key private key transmission is going to be quantum key distribution, which works very well in space, because in, in free space, it's pretty easy to implement. So uh, thank you very much, Sasha. Very informative, very educational. Thank you.